Thanks, guys, for coming to DevConf, and thanks for choosing to attend my talk. Um, I'm a product manager at Red Hat. My name is Brian Cook, and I work on um, some of our internal facing systems, specifically in the area of secure supply chain. So I work on systems that are used to build uh, bits at Red Hat that eventually get shipped to customers. And so you can understand that we're fairly particular about those systems and uh, the other systems that they interact with, the security of those systems. And um, yeah, we've actually been building a whole, a whole new supply chain system from the ground up over the last couple years. And it's been extremely interesting work. Um, today, I was gonna, I'm going to talk about SBOMs. Um, and SBOMs just like one, one little piece of all the things that we do, but it's kind of an important one. And so why, why are SBOMs important? Um, every, we started hearing about SBOMs um, right around this date, this magic date right here. In, in 2021, in response to a couple of significant breaches, um, one of which was the Colonial Pipeline breach, um, which was a, actually a, um, like a ransomware attack against some pretty, pretty important infrastructure. Um, and then another attack, which was the solar winds one, also super high profile, right? Um, this executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity was issued, and one subsection of that deals with SBOMs. And it started a little bit of a panic because uh, basically software producers were told that they needed to have these uh, source bill of materials, SBOMs, and they needed to be able to uh, ensure they were accurate and ship them with all their products. And it turns out that this is not that easy to do. <laughs> um, and you know, the, it, there was very little clarity on um, how, how accuracy would be enforced and what date um, that, that it would be. So it turns out um, that now we're three, three years and change later, no enforcements actually started happening on the SBOM side. But um, the interesting thing is that even though the government hasn't started to enforce the delivery of SBOMs, our customers are asking us for those because they're starting to realize that the value of those is, um, you know, sort of, there's, there's more value to it than just what well, the government says you must do it. Um, and so whether or not enforcement comes, I think it will come. We don't, we don't know when. But whether or not enforcement comes, we need to do it because it has benefits other than, well, compliance. Um, and this is my, my, my joke slide. And if you, if you know, you know. And if you don't know, you can go Google this. <clears throat> so there are six, six types of SBOMs defined by CISA. Um, and honestly, a lot of them are kind of useless. Um, but there's these design, design SBOMs, which is like, I'm going to build something, and I'm going to include the following things. We all definitely do that, right? For sure. <laughs> and then there's the source SBOM. And this one is a SBOM created from your local dev environment. I don't think any of us actually produce these on purpose, but they kind of get produced from plugins like um, the dependent, we have a dependency analytics plugin that does something pretty close to this. Sneak has a plugin as well. And they essentially are looking at your requirements files or looking at your local pip env or your go mods. And it's saying, hey, you, you know, your local dev environment has, is using a vulnerable package. Maybe you should update it before you get push. Um, but this is more of like for an individual user. There's the build SBOM. And this thing should be created by your build system. And it could be the same as the SBOM if your build system is your laptop, but please don't do that. Um, then, then there's these analyzed SBOMs. This is something created uh, post facto. So the build's done, and we don't have an SBOM for our build, but we want to make one anyway. So we go get a tool, and we run it against the, uh, the container. And it magically produces an SBOM, which has got to be super great. Um, and another way you could do this is by hand. Um, but if you've ever seen one of these things, they're extremely long. Uh, it would be very, very tedious. Uh, deployed and runtime ones are more about like operations environments. So what's actually installed on a system, it's going to be looking for like whole collections of SBOMs of things that are there. And runtime, runtime is like, what is actually being used that's installed on my system. There are a couple startups that are doing this like live instrumentation. Um, shout out to one, a guy I used to work for is running a company called Edgebit. 
and they, they, they're in this business where they're actually looking at like memory and CPU processes that are running, and they're actually saying, well, this vulnerability is in code executing. This other one is on your system, it's installed, but you're not, nothing's using it, so it's kind of not a big deal. But this is, this is like on the edge of uh, capability set, I'd say right now, provided by a few small, um, small companies. So the, then maybe the next relevant question is, do I need an SBOM? Like, I think there's, there's two reasons why you might want one. Um, and the first one is compliance. So you need one of these if you're in a regulated industry where you already or you think you might um, need to be able to attest to what kind of software is running in your infrastructure. Um, and if you're on the content producer side, you need one if you're in an industry where you think you're going to be told that you have to start delivering these to people or if your customers are already asking for them anyway. And the other reason is because, uh, and I'll, I'll get into this more in a minute, but the other one is because SFOMs actually give us some interesting advantages for doing vulnerability detection. Oh, it's, that's, that's an SBO now. Just pretend there's an M there. <clears throat> Popular formats for SBOMs. Um, so there's actually quite a lot of formats, more than I knew about before I started looking into this. But the main ones that you're going to hear about are Cyclone DX and SPDX, by far outweighing the other ones. There's a distant third one, which is SWID tags, which almost never comes up in actual conversations about SBOMs, but if you start looking at web pages enumerating types, you'll see it listed there. SPDX and Cyclone DX are definitely kind of the, the talk. Um, and Cyclone DX, they're, they're both fine. Cyclone DX was actually created specifically for describing SBOMs, uh, and it's set as pretty limited to that. Um, not too limited, it's just that it doesn't try to do lots of things, which sometimes can be really good. SPDX actually started before that as a way to um, as a metadata format for describing licenses, and then evolved into an SBOM format. And for us at Red Hat, specifically with uh, lots of open source license pro proliferation and us needing to catalog that and communicate it to people, and sometimes even gate software based on the kind of license, you know, we shouldn't be shipping this license, but we can ship that one. That's really interesting for us, so we've, we've decided to use SPDX um, just because we, we have that specific um, but they're both pretty good. So how can you go about generating SBOMs? Um, like I said before, you can do it by hand. Um, I've seen some SBOMs which blew my mind. They were a couple hundred megs. So if you want to write a couple hundred megs of text by hand, you go for that. I'm not going to. Um, SIFT is a super popular tool for creating SBOMs. It's, uh, it's an open source project. It was backed by a company called Anchor. Um, we use SIFT. We, uh, we actually contribute a bit to SIFT as well. Um, I'm going to show some demos using SIFT in a minute. Um, and it does a reasonably good job at what it can do, which is uh, that post facto analyzed type SBOM, right? Doesn't have context from your build environment. It just has your bits. Um, there's some other ones. Cyclone DX actually has its own plugin for Maven and Gradle because the guy who started Cyclone DX is a big Java nerd. Um, they're supposed to be pretty good, but I know almost nothing about Java, so I cannot attest to that. You can check them out. Um, there's an SPDX SBOM generator project, which I found, which is cool. It actually was started by Microsoft and open source. I haven't played with it yet, but I'm going to check into it and see what it does. But just from reading the readme file, I can see that it first thing it says is, here are the package managers we support. And this is a, um, this is an issue that all of these solutions have, and that is that um, they are generally relying on package manager databases for discovering content. And there's another thing that you've probably used a whole bunch of in your career that uses package manager databases for discovering content, and it's vulnerability scanners. And if you look at actually how Anchor has two tools, one's called SIFT and one's called Gripe. And in vulnerability scanner kind of landscape, Nearly every scanner has two parts. Claire, who you know, I know a lot about because it's a Red Hat project, um, they call theirs the indexer and then the matcher. The indexer's job is to identify what's in the object, like what's in this container or this tr file tree or whatever. It's pretty much exactly what a post, you know, kind of a post facto analyzed SBOM scanner is doing. And the matcher's job is just to take that data and then go out to like NVD or some other uh, 
vulnerability database and then try and figure out, okay, now that I think I know what's in here, what vulnerabilities apply to this content? So if you've used vulnerability scanners in the past and you've experienced false positives, false negatives, you're gonna have all the exact kind of problems with these post facto um, SBOM generation tools because they are essentially the exact same thing. It's just that instead of keeping the data uh, kind of behind the curtain, generating the matching vulnerability set for you and then giving the results, it just stops after doing the, the indexing or discovery and it just hands you a nice formatted um, set of data saying here's what's in here and it's it really it needs to be taken with a grain of salt about whether that is accurate or not. Like you need to know that it's, it's doing the best job that it can um, and it's definitely better than nothing but it can, it can absolutely have inaccuracies in it. <clears throat> so here's some information. Um, it was actually generated by my colleague, Rogue, here, um, who's in Red Hat Product Security. And uh, looking at uh, a build time SBOM versus a, like a generated SBOM using SIFT after the, after the fact, I think it was SIFT, um, 219 RPMs versus 261 RPMs. 1,300 Go packages versus 109, or 199. That, what I find really interesting about this is we get more RPMs than we actually should, but less Golang packages than we actually should. And um, Java, I've seen this NPM problem a lot of times, and it's especially bad when they are, well, it's, it can't get worse than zero. But, but uh, um, <laughs> if, you, if you see uh, jar files and war files, they have uh, a lot of times lots of things embedded inside them. If you're embedding uh, NPM packages inside of a jar file for like a Java application with a UI, you'll almost never get any results for the modules that are embedded inside there. They are completely missed. So instead of working with that one, which is actually a really kind of big and complicated example, um, I wanted to work with a little smaller one and see if we can come up with some general ways in which we can improve on this. So I created a fake UBI 9 build, um, creatively called Newbie, not UBI 9. Um, and it has 192 packages in it, which should theoretically be exactly the same number of packages as UBI 9, but at least it's pretty close. Um, SIFT reports 210 packages. So if you look at this, you know, we had the 219, 261. It's the same problem that's happening, which is that we're getting duplicate reports between the RPMs installed and reported by the RPM database. And it's also seeing some of the content that was actually exploded from those RPMs into the file system. And it doesn't understand that those are part of the package. It thinks that maybe they're something else. So that's why we get these duplicate reports. Um, you can see an example of this right here for subscription manager where I am seeing subscription manager as an RPM. And I am also seeing subscription manager as a Python module, which you know we really, we really don't want that because uh, Vulnerabilities, I'm going to talk about this later, but like vulnerabilities are only going to re be reported against one of these. So the other one is either going to have no data or just wrong data. It can definitely have wrong data, especially in the case where um, the, the, the scanner also misunderstands that there are backports involved, right? So I want to make a better SVOM. And in fact, I want to add my own binary to it and not screw it up. So how can I do it? I want to, uh, the ability to run hermetic builds and isolate some content could be helpful. Um, it's going to definitely take extra, extra effort than writing SIFT container go. Um, and I think if you, if you would want to do this, it would be a very good idea to review your output with an expert um, so that you can get, uh, get your process tuned. But once you get your process tuned, um, it, it'll mostly just run unless you make you know, big changes to your build. So here we go. I'm going to do the first demo I've ever done on a Chromebook. So. <laughs> All right. Can we see this okay? Cool. I have a bunch of uh, numbered scripts here to help me not screw up. And uh, I'm going to start by, and, and some, the Wi-Fi in here is a little sketchy, and I have pre-cached some of this stuff, so I'm going to show what they do. But if it takes a long time, I might kill it. And we can move on. Um, First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use a tool that we have internally, um, and it's an open source project called Cache2. And its job is to prefetch 
uh, dependencies for a build based on lock files. So for example, if you have like a requirements.txt file and use pip compile to fully depth solve it and um, pin it, you can use it to, to go fetch all those things and make them available off to the side for a minute. Right? And I'm actually using this in an interesting and new way because I'm using it with an RPM lock file um, using a prototype we developed to be able to pin RPMs to specific versions in source code in your Git repo. So instead of running um, like yum install or dnf install and having it depth solve live, we're doing very much like what, what pip compile does and we're depth solving it ahead of time and then we're committing the depth solved information to a lock file and using that to install the prefetched RPMs at build time. So we know exactly what we're gonna get. We know we're not gonna get like a new sneaky version that just got released of some specific RPM that we didn't test. This is the one that usually takes a long time, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna wait for it. But trust me, I prefetched them and they're available in this, in this folder. Um, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use it to build my container. Um, so this is, like I said, just sort of a, like a fake UBI 9 build. So there's nothing in this build but RPMs. Actually, that guy created this build process. He's really smart. There's nothing in here but RPM, so when we look at this, it shouldn't say anything but RPM. But what we do get is like we, what, like we saw before, we see RPMs and we see Python packages duplicating the content that's in the RPMs. That subscription manager example came right from here. Um, and I should be able to look at this one. Yeah, this is the, uh, the output here. And you can see in my example, is that the output? No, it's not the output. Oh, we didn't do that yet. We just built a container. Sorry, I stepped ahead. We wanna, now that we uh, built a container, we want to create an SBOM from the prefetch cache, not from the container. The prefetch cache, remember, only downloaded RPMs and only the ones in our lock file. So now we're going to use SIFT and we're scanning the prefetch cache, not the container image. That means now we have this prefetch cache JSON, and I have all these things in here, but they're, it's clean. There's only RPMs listed here because the folder that I, that I set it to scan, it just had a bunch of RPMs sitting in it. But one thing that's not so good here is there's these CPE IDs, these reference locators, and it turns out these are really important because if you go and you search NVD, the CPE ID is how you actually match the piece of content you have to vulnerabilities that have been logged in NVD. And the CPE IDs that get spit out by SIFT are just made up most of the time because it doesn't, it doesn't know how to find the actual CPE ID for the content you fed it. So this is, this is a problem and we wanna fix it. Now the thing about CPE IDs is that they're by product. So like rel9 base has a CPE ID that applies to all the content for it. So what I'm gonna do, because I know that that's what I'm building from, is I'm gonna set the CPE ID. And now when I go back, you can see that I have the correct CPE ID for my whole list of RPMs here. Now I have a very clean RPMs only SBOM with correct CPE IDs. Now the next thing that I want to do is uh, I want to build a very simple Hello World Go app. And I want to be able to add it to my container to build a layered application image. And I want to not screw up my original, my original SBOM that I just meticulously curated. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to create using SIFT. Now I'm actually scanning the container. And I'm just taking whatever it gives me. So this is going to give me those duplicated Python and RPM packages, right? Takes a minute. After this, I'm gonna build my very fancy Hello Go JSON, or I mean my Hello Go uh, binary. And what I'm kind of getting at, I'll try to explain it here, is that what I wanna do is I wanna get a snapshot of what SIFT thinks is in this image, warts and all. And I'm gonna use it when I scan the final image to, um, to remove all the inaccurate entries and replace them with my 
clean SBOM. So now I'm building my image. I have my, I have my bad SBOM. It's what SIFT thinks is in there. It's got all the RPMs, but it's also got the duplicates. Now I'm building my other image. And finally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take another snapshot, another, another SBOM. Now this is the layered image. So I have, I have my one I made from the prefetch cache, which I know is right. I have my one I made from that same image that I built from the prefetch cache, which I know is wrong in specific ways. And I have another image, which I have now used the base image I created for, and then added my Go binary to. And now I'm using SIFT to create another base image, or another SBOM of that one. So I expect them to overlap. And I expect them to overlap in all the ways that are inaccurate as well. And so the last thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to run um, this SIFT math. <laughs> and essentially, it's, it's taking the two SBOMs from before, the, the bad one from the base image and the bad one from the layered image, and it's taking out everything that's duplicated between them. And so what I'm left with is just three packages. It's my hello world binary, my go standard lib, and my uh, hello go OCI uh, artifact reference. And now I know that all I need to do is take this three package bomb and add it to my original base image bomb, which I know was right, and I have a perfectly clean bomb with correct CPE IDs. The one last thing I could do with this if I knew it is if I have a product CPE ID I report vulnerabilities against, I could also update the CPE IDs for these three packages. Um, and then I would have a, a correct layered image that references two product streams and has extremely accurate data. So it's a bit complicated, I admit, but um, with some automation, uh, we could probably make this into a fairly repeatable task. When you plug it into your build automation system, um, this can pretty seamlessly churn out uh, really, really highly accurate bombs, much more accurate than you would get from just throwing your content at like one of the post facto scanners without you, ha without you putting guardrails around it, right? You're, we're using it, it's doing what we need it to do, but it needs help, it needs guardrails, it needs a little direction. So we talked a lot about vulnerabilities, so I wanna address one thing. Oh, I'm off, I'm off the slide, so let's get there. Will my SBOM tell me about vulnerabilities? Your SBOM by itself will not tell you anything about vulnerabilities. What your SBOM tells you is what's there. You need that other part, that matcher part, or you need some other document that tells you. There's two ways to basically get the vulnerability data. You can take the SBOM as hopefully a better representation of the content that's inside the image, and you can go back to matching against NVD or OSV or you know, whatever your favorite thing is. But another way you could do it is with VEX. So CSF VEX is a, a standard for another document, and it essentially allows a content producer, um, like an upstream project or a Red Hat or, or anyone like that, to publish documents, and we can reference those documents specifically from an SBOM. So it could be a link in the SBOM saying, for the latest vulnerability data for this uh, container, go to this location. And so instead of having to try to figure out what's in a container and then try to match it against some third party source, you can actually get a, a document from the content producer that says, this is what's in the container. And another document that says, and these are the vulnerabilities against that. And that's a much more you know, deterministic and precise way of doing it. So we are, uh, we are supporting CSFX, and we are working to enable these, uh, these VEX uh, enabled SBOMs. Now, depending on the tool you're using, you'll need to make sure that your tool respects these references, because it, it could absolutely just ignore them and go back to searching NVD. It could go back to detecting components. Um, so you really have to, you have to understand what you want it to do and make sure that it's doing it. Another aspect of SBOMs I touched on earlier is about licenses. And um, I won't even open it, but just trust me, licenses in SBOMs are, are pretty much a train wreck. And it's, it's not the, the tool's fault, actually. It has to do with we, that we don't do a very good job in the open source community of uh, following any sort of standard 
for posting machine-readable license data in our source code repositories. They're all, it's all over the place. Go find 100 source code repositories, and you probably find 150 ways to, to, uh, to, to put your licenses there. And way, you know, you'll find every misspelling and variation of you know, GPL v3 that there could possibly be. Um, we want, we want to fix that for ourselves, again, because of some of our customer ob obligations. There's a really interesting Git repo um, at clearly defined slash curated data where folks have basically started to try to build up a repository of um, mapping packages to licenses. And we are, we're going to be working with these folks to essentially look for packages that don't have good license data figure out what it is. And it's simple, you, you add a pull request, you get a couple of reviews so that people check and make sure that you're right, um, and it gets merged there. And you can treat this um, kind of like, how we intend to do this is kind of have a, our own downstream of it because we might want to fix an issue before we're able to get a change pushed up to an upstream project or before we can even get it into clearly defined. So we're going to run a fork of it um, where we put our data and we create pull requests from our fork upstream we will use our fork um, for actually enhancing, for injecting information into the S-bonds. This is a pattern that could be repeated by anybody. Um, and it allows you to carry your own licensing data. If you have a disagreement with you know, a maintainer of the repository, you could just carry a, carry a patch there indefinitely if you needed to. It gives you flexibility, um, but participation, and you can contribute and, and benefit from this community. So it's a really good thing to check out. S-bonds can also refer to each other. Um, this is really neat because you can have like uh, an SBOM for a container refer to an SBOM for an RPM. But we can also kind of go too far with this. Um, so we will probably be implementing these kinds of references. And the question is like, who's this for, right? I could add references for all the RPMs that I showed in my SBOM, and we can have and will have uh, RPM SBOMs. So it actually shows you. But that's really useful for us because we need to know what's inside those RPMs because when we do incident response, which is how we like respond to uh, newly discovered vulnerabilities, we, we need to know, okay, is the thing that the vulnerability was uh, logged against in any of our RPMs? So we really need that data. But as an end user, you kind of don't need that data. You only need the data down to the level where the advisories or the uh, CVEs are filed. And for us, we file... CVEs against RPMs, and we file CVEs against uh, containers, and sometimes against you know some other like Java artifacts. But like sub artifact level information is neat, but for the end user, not super relevant. So where we're going um, to finish up with SBOMs, a lot of the work we have now is about building scalable systems um, that are searchable that index all these SBOMs we're producing. So we're using a project called Trustification to do that. Um, and we will have like a, a great big giant database, essentially, a, a graph database of how our SBOMs all relate to each other, the packages that they use. And we power our, uh, we will power our incident response um, work with that. We will be integrating that with existing data services that use GraphQL so that we can use vulnerability data like in other business areas that are related to it. So an easy one, if you're an end user, would be like in the customer portal. We use GraphQL backends, and if we want to show vulnerability data in the customer portal, we'll be able to get all the metadata we want about the stuff in the catalog and the packages that are in it and the vulnerabilities that apply to those packages all in one big fast query. Um, we're continuously kind of reducing our usage of SIFT or adding guardrails around it, like I showed earlier, and adding post-processing to do things like fix license data, um, increasing our reliance on VEX and producing VEX files promoting the uses of SBOMs for vulnerability scanning instead of doing detection, um, and adding support for new content types to Cache 2 because that was the thing I used to kind of put some walls around package detection there. So everything we want to do this with, we need support there. And that's it. Thanks, guys, for, for coming and seeing my talk. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. So question. In your demo, I couldn't see what you used to build the images. I assume your very first image was built from scratch? Yeah. OK. First one was from scratch, yeah. OK, cool. Thanks. 
Thanks, Brian. Uh, question about the tools you used. I think you, if I got it correctly, you mentioned that you were using some internal tools. Are, do, do you plan to make all of these open source? They're Is it all, all going to be? They're all, they, they're all open source, source yeah. so they're all available in Fedora. Uh, they're, they're not necessarily in Fedora, like Cache 2 is not available as a Fedora package, but it is, an, it is available. You can go get it and install it and contribute to it or whatever, yeah. Awesome, thank yeah. you. I, can, I, will, I will add a list of tools um, on the last slide here and then upload these later today. It's a good, good point. I'll make a note to myself. Anyone else? Oh, we have Louis. Yeah, so for there, I didn't realize the clearly defined project. That seems really interesting. Yeah. Uh, are there any plans of integrating that with Kachito? Kachi 2. Um, so the thing about Kachi 2 right now is it doesn't actually produce bombs. Did you know that? It doesn't? I nope. thought it did. No. No. I couldn't find anything. I actually thought it did too, but then I learned it doesn't. It, it produces some partial information that it'll later produce, we add to the bomb. It'll produce a package list, but like if I want to create a bomb, I really need something that's formatted as either SPDX JSON or Cyclone DX JSON. So Cache2 gives me a really clean like directory structure that I can scan, which gives me good results with SIFT because it, it like puts those guardrails around it. But Cache2 at the moment doesn't natively output any Cyclone DX or SPDX JSON. So I think step one would be, do we want it to? That could be really interesting mm -hmm. um, based on level of effort. And then if it did that, then yeah, we could start looking at um, adding capabilities like the license enhancement as like native functions. Cool, thank you. Um, oh, sorry, uh, great presentation, Brian, thank you. Um, what about situations where prefetching dependencies is not is like a challenge or an option? Like what are the, what are the, I guess, I guess I don't know the, the specific stuff, but I know that we have that disabled in certain places and I was just curious what, if there's like a workaround, if you can't prefetch uh, like the RPM dependencies. Yeah. Most of our limitations around prefetching right now are based on package manager support. So for example, we have support for like, uh, well, we did have support, we will have support for uh, Ruby. We had it in one, we're moving it to two. Cache 2 versus V1. Um, we have support for Go. We have support now for RPMs um, for both Yarn and NPM. Um, this guy works on Cache 2. I'm trying to think. Pyth yeah, Python. Um, we're working on Rust. Uh, we're working on bringing Ruby back. Um, and you know, we, we want to keep expanding that so that we don't you don't have the problem of that. If you really oh, we are also adding support for something interesting, which will allow you to use curl to pull artifacts that you, maybe we don't have explicit package manager support for, like which arbitrary. could help with things like um, if I need C++ libraries, you know, I could, I could like fetch them with curl since if I don't want to like choose one of the weird ecosystem of package managers that are there. Um, and so that there's, there's options there. But if you didn't want to do prefetch at all, um, I think one way it would be to influence the detector's behavior. So for example, before when I was getting those duplicates, it was because it was detecting um, Python content and RPM content. I probably could coerce it into giving me the same output by disabling its indexer for Python, or basically disabling everything except RPMs, right? And then like I could, I could go through and iteratively do that for the content that I know is there and put more. It's all about like understanding what is in there if you know there's only RPMs in there, turn everything off but RPMs, right? right? And then you're going to get the right output. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 